Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for the Oli Foundation webinar, Pediatric Transition to Adult Care. My name is Andrea Guidi. I am the Executive Assistant for the Oli Foundation. Most of you are probably familiar with the Oli Foundation, but just in case this is your first experience, I'd like to briefly introduce the organization. The Oli Foundation strives to enrich the lives of those living with home nutrition support, both intravenous nutrition, sometimes called HPN or TPN, and tube feeding. We do this through education, outreach, and networking. The Oli Foundation was founded in 1983 by Dr. Lynn Howard and her patient, Clarence Oli Oldenburg. Today, we serve approximately 19,000 members. All of our programs are free of charge for patients and their families. First, a few housekeeping details. You should see a toolbar on the right side of your screen. Click on the orange arrow to show the control panel. In the questions section, you can type any questions you have for me or for the presenter. Please note we will not be responding to the hand raising function in the control panel. We will answer as many of the questions as possible during the questions and answers period at the end of the presentation. We'll post a recording of the presentation and handouts after the webinar on the OLI website. Please note that we have muted all of the participants, so you don't need to worry if there is background noise where you are taking this webinar. If you are having technical issues, please go to the Citrix website at the address on your screen. Now for the presentation. Transition to adulthood is an exciting time. However, as youth with special health needs mature and prepare for independence, they face greater challenges than their peers, including moving to a new set of adult providers who think and operate very differently than the pediatric providers that have seen them all their lives. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Tom Jaksik. Dr. Jaksik is W. Hardy Hendren, Professor of Surgery, Harvard Medical School, Vice Chairman, Pediatric General Surgery at Boston Children's Hospital, and Surgical Director Center of Advanced Intestinal Rehabilitation at Boston Children's Hospital. We are thankful to have you presenting today. Dr. Jaksik, I will turn over the presentation to you now. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, uh, to speak today. Uh, it's a tremendous honor. Uh, what uh, I'd like to talk about is, are really pediatric transitions to adult care as it pertains to intestinal failure. And I talk to you really from the standpoint of uh, someone who uh, works within a uh, interdisciplinary program. Uh, we started ours. Uh, uh, approximately 20 years ago, Chris Duggan and I founded it. And we have uh, MDs, nurses, dietitians, pharmacists, uh, our NICU radiology transplant, social work, speech, and psychology all involved in this very uh, uh, interdisciplinary program, uh, which we uh, try to make as patient centric as possible. I think that. Similar programs are now extant uh, around the United States, and uh, uh, probably uh, this is the model of care uh, for the future of uh, uh, all children with uh, intestinal uh, failure. Uh, this is just a picture of uh, the people that showed up uh, to our uh, um, uh, uh, clinic a few months ago. As you can see, it's a very busy a uh, large group of people that take care of a, a very complex set of patients. The first thing I'd like to do uh, is give you an overview of pediatric intestinal failure. Uh, really, where are we in 2018? And it's important to know these basic facts before we discuss uh, issues with management into adulthood. Uh, the incidence, prognosis, and outcomes uh, of intestinal failure uh, are, uh, are really uh, fundamental to our uh, uh, understanding of how we transition patients into adulthood and also, most importantly, uh, why this has become such an important uh, question. 
the most common causes of intestinal failure are actually neonatal problems. Uh, necrotizing enterocolitis being the most frequent. Interestingly, necrotizing enterocolitis has the uh, greatest likelihood of weaning from parenteral nutrition uh, uh, of any of the diseases that we uh, uh, treat uh, when standardized for bowel length. And we think that's because of the great potential that premature neonates have for bowel development and adaptation. The next big cause is gastroschisis, again, a neonatal disease. Um, the intestine is uh, outside of the abdomen. Interestingly, the survivorship to one year uh, uh, with one year follow up of children with gastroschisis is now 98% in the United States. But nutritional morbidity is present, and the median time to full enteral nutrition is 37 days. However, there is a large tail of patients who have uh, motility disorders and other associated problems with gastroschisis who uh, then end up in intestinal failure uh, programs. The next cause is again a neonatal cause. It's intestinal atresia. Uh, intestinal atresia is an in utero vascular accident. Uh, the most uh, 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 severe forms are type 3 atresias or type 4 atresias. And uh, very recently, we have become cognizant of the association of type 4 atresias and uh, SCIDS, uh, which is an immunodeficiency disorder. Um, uh, again, all of these are uh, pediatric problems. The last thing that we uh, see as a common entity is uh, mid-gut volvulus, uh, which is due to a malrotation of the intestine. This allows the intestine to spin on its own uh, vascular supply and cut it off. If one doesn't uh, uh, reach the bowel within six hours, the whole of the mid-gut dies. Uh, the recent advances here are that with continued rehabilitation, the majority of patients with uh, mid-gut volvulus actually transition to full enteral nutrition. So despite losing the whole of the mid-gut, it is now possible to transition these patients to full enteral nutrition. Then there are a compendium of much rarer disorders uh, which form the remainder of the uh, pediatric population, Hirschsprung's disease uh, being uh, one of those. Hirschsprung's disease, unfortunately, doesn't only affect the uh, distal colon, but can extend into the small bowel, and that's where we reach problems. But that's where we have problems uh, that uh, result in patients coming to intestinal failure uh, centers. Uh, this is a review article that we uh, recently wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it shows all of the complexities that most of you are familiar with, with pediatric intestinal failure. It really becomes a multi-system uh, uh, disorder with many nuances. One thing that we have found in our center and is actually translatable to the whole of uh, 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 the United States and Canada is that uh, as intestinal failure programs have evolved, baseline survival has increased from about 70% five-year to approximately 90% five-year survival. And uh, there are a series of very good articles that look at that. And uh, just the presence of interdisciplinary care and careful detailed management has resulted in this huge boon in survival. Of course, what this means for us is that these patients ultimately will attain adulthood. And uh, uh, as we'll discuss at the end of the talk, what can we do to help these patients transition from our pediatric programs uh, into adult care? The treatment for intestinal failure in a nutshell is the initiation of enteral nutrition. Once we do that, hepatic injury is minimized, the risk of sepsis is almost completely eliminated, and there is a uh, improvement in quality of life, both for the uh, patient and their caretaker. This is an interesting graph that you see, and you'll see a sigmoid curve in front of you. And uh, on one side, you will see the bowel length at the bottom, 
and then the probability of weaning from parenteral nutrition on the right-hand side. So where that curve crosses zero is the length of bowel on average required to wean from parenteral nutrition uh, uh, for a neonate in approximately the year uh, 2000, and that's 35 centimeters of small bowel. What we have seen is indicated by the right uh, by the red arrow as this has shifted to the left. So now the 50th percent IVP likelihood of weaning from parental nutrition, where 50 percent of patients can attain this goal, is 20 centimeters of small bowel, and that continues to decrease as uh, 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 we get better in our management strategies. Now, it is true that approximately 80% of all patients with severe intestinal failure will eventually wean to full enteral nutrition. And although uh, we would like to think it's because of our superb care, it's really important to know that biology greatly favors us. There are two curves here in front of you. One is a red curve, one is a yellow curve. The yellow curve shows the requirement of protein in grams per kilo per day uh, as one ages. And from the time that one is a neonate to the time one reaches 18, there's a five-fold reduction in the requirement of protein. What this means is that the bowel needs to work one-fifth as hard when one is older. And of course, the intestine grows, even if a segment of it has been lost, in proportion to one's length. The red line shows energy, uh, energy requirements. And here, the story is a little different. Uh, all of you who have children uh, know that from age uh, 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 two to four, they uh, uh, have extremely high uh, uh, resting energy requirements. However, uh, that also decreases with time. And again, there's an over four, fourfold reduction in the uh, uh, caloric requirement. And this decreases even further as one attains adulthood. And the average adult may require only 25 kcals per kilo per day, while a neonate may require just over 100 kcals per kilo per day. So biology greatly favors rehabilitation. And if we can keep our patients alive over time and keep them flourishing, there is a tendency to come off uh, parental nutrition throughout life. There have also been multiple recent innovations. And by recent, I mean within the last uh, uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, they're nutritional, they're medical, they're surgical. We have learned to avoid intestinal failure-associated liver disease. Uh, Low-dose omega-6 lipids at one gram per kilo per day are FDA-approved and used and are successful in minimizing intestinal failure-associated liver disease. The use of omega-6, MCT oleic, and omega-3 uh, mixtures, sometimes called SMOF, is FDA-approved and used. One can give higher doses of uh, lipid uh, uh, using this uh, formulation. And lastly, omega-3 lipids, uh, omega then one gram per kilo per day, has very recently been FDA approved and uh, uh, will be uh, uh, distributed without the need for compassionate use through the United States uh, shortly. Lastly, there's a, a tremendous interest and has been for quite a while in structured lipids. The lipid backbone uh, can have various fatty acids attached to it, and these new fatty acids may be even better than what we, uh, a combination of fatty acids may be better than what we uh, have currently. This just shows a graph of uh, bilirubin reduction with the uh, use of the Megavan, which uh, uh, was uh, 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 done at our center with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Drs. Mark Buter and Kathleen Gura uh, uh, leading those investigations. The other thing that's uh, happened uh, over the last uh, decade is that 
uh, um, surgeons do not tie off vessels uh, anymore. We reuse access. Interventional radiology techniques have improved. 70% ethanol locks to reduce catheter-associated bloodstream infections uh, have been proven to be infected. And you can see in this picture just a biofilm in a catheter. And we've gotten much better at managing that, uh, these lines. Uh, right now, approximately 80% of all uh, uh, pediatric patients with home PN have a Groviac-type catheter. This just shows the reduction in uh, catheter-associated bloodstream infections in uh, home PN uh, patients per 1,000 catheter days uh, with the use of ethanol locks. Endoscopy has also improved, and it continues to improve. Uh, pediatric endoscopists uh, now can uh, easily diagnose causes of GI bleeding uh, with biopsies. They can differentiate uh, eosinophilic enteritis from uh, uh, bacterial overgrowth, from anastomotic ulcers. Uh, we're beginning to understand the microbiome and its relationship to bacterial overgrowth and can now uh, directly sample contents from the duodenum and uh, see what is actually growing within the bowel in refractory cases. The next uh, major advance has been the uh, use of uh, teduglutide, which is a long-acting GLP-2 analog that uh, allows uh, the bowel to uh, 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 grow and uh, uh, proliferate to improve uh, absorption. Uh, the uh, interesting aspect of this is that it is FDA approved for adults uh, based on this randomized control trial that you see here, uh, which is, was associated with a reduction in requirements for parental nutrition. Uh, there are pediatric multicenter trials that are currently undergoing analysis. Uh, and uh, uh, from our uh, limited uh, uh, exposure to uh, uh, patients that we have enrolled, uh, it does seem that the dublatide certainly works in children. The huge advantage in children is that since we know that requirements decrease over time, these hormonal, hormonal therapies may allow us to wean from PN earlier, but it does not necessarily mean that these patients will need to stay on this hormonal therapy throughout their life. In fact, we would expect them uh, to uh, uh, not require it as they get older. A surgical therapy has also uh, uh, um, uh, gone forward. Autologous intestinal reconstructive surgery, or AIRS, was a concept first uh, promulgated by uh, uh, Adrian Bianchi in Manchester uh, in around 1980. Uh, newer operations, such as the serial transfer enteroplasty that we developed uh, um, at Boston Children's, uh, uh, is an easier form of uh, doing this. This just shows a picture in a neonate, basically tapers the bowel. Uh, subsequent to this, the bowel uh, has increased levels of uh, uh, GLP-2. It uh, tends to grow and widen and surface area increases after a step. Um, the data uh, uh, from the step registry show that about two thirds of PN dependent children show improved enteral tolerance after a step. They have to have dilated bowel in order for this to be done. And about uh, half of them are weaned from PN completely. This tends to occur within a framework of uh, six months uh, postoperatively. Uh, we view all of these operations as just uh, 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 intermediate. So I, there are cleverer ways to uh, grow bowel. There's tension-induced growth. Uh, the use of extraluminal shaped memory polymers is something that we've done, and others have tried intraluminal similar uh, uh, materials. <coughs> Excuse me. These materials auto expand when they're put in a uh, uh, warm or moist environment, and the uh, uh, intestine grows. Uh, there are still problems with adhesion formation, so it's still not used uh, clinically. In the future, there is tissue engineered bowel. Uh, this has been done in uh, uh, animal models. Um, uh, particularly exciting uh, is the concept of using stem cells in conjunction with a uh, bowel construct. Intestinal transplant has also uh, uh, gotten much better. Um, and 
uh, uh, small successful transplants are now possible. Uh, this is a multivisceral transplant that we placed in a uh, uh, complex uh, child with intestinal failure who was approximately five kilos. So the technical aspects of this operation have been uh, um, uh, largely solved. The indication for transplantation are really end-stage intestinal failure associated liver disease, which of course is decreasing in uh, incidence. Uh, cirrhosis per se is not an indication. Um, absence of ID access, which is again now rare for the reasons that I've touched on, is another uh, uh, indication for a transplant. One thing that we have yet to uh, uh, completely uh, explore is the potential improvement in quality of life if one has an intestinal transplant. This needs to be balanced now by an increased mortality and helping our patients understand this, particularly as they uh, uh, reach the age of uh, 18 and older, uh, where uh, the likelihood of weaning from PN uh, decreases substantively um, uh, is something that we need to do in the future. Intestinal transplant data uh, uh, is uh, uh, quite interesting. As I mentioned, there's been a 25% reduction in intestinal transplant uh, numbers, presumably because of better intestinal rehabilitation. However, there are over 1,000 patients alive in the United States with functioning intestinal grafts, about half are children. The uh, five-year pediatric survival associated with intestinal transplants is isolated intestinal transplants is 75% which is really amazing considering that the first intestinal transplant was only done in 1986, the first successful one. And uh, in 2015, the five-year pediatric uh, uh, survival for liver intestine or multivisceral transplant is 62%. However, it's still important to note that a, uh, a child uh, who uh, uh, has uh, uh, intestinal failure and is a, on the PN has a five-year survival now of 90% uh, or greater. Uh, so that's, uh, although the two are coming together in terms of survival, um, uh, it still is not uh, uh, an even uh, uh, situation. So where are we in 2018? Well, bowel rehabilitation remains the mainstay of therapy and it's usually successful. Nutritional and medical surgical innovations are ongoing and it's quite an exciting time to be in this field. Intestinal failure patients now are expected to reach adulthood. And with this, there's been actually a huge shift in emphasis in intestinal failure programs, and that's from reducing mortality to reducing morbidity, optimizing neurodevelopmental outcomes, and improving quality of life. And that's where we are. And that brings us to the major issue, and that is transitioning into adult care. We now anticipate long-term survival to be greater than 90%. Um, center data indicate about 80% of patients with, intestinal, with severe intestinal failure wean to full enteral nutrition. However, there are significant long-term problems that remain in all subsets of the intestinal failure population. What are these? Well, the long-term considerations which go into, which we do extend into uh, adulthood are uh, weight maintenance, of vitamin and trace mineral deficiencies, a very large proportion of patients have these and require supplements, electrolyte imbalance, uh, and coordination of home enteral nutrition and parenteral nutrition. The medical problems are intestinal dysmotility, bacterial overgrowth, GI bleeding, cirrhosis, and it's important to note there's an incidence of 10% even with normal bilirubins, and severe metabolic bone disease, uh, which uh, has an incidence of 34% from a recent study. So all of these things extend into adulthood and need to be watched carefully. Surgically, uh, patients with intestinal failure are subject to bowel obstruction, bowel dilation, fistula formation, uh, enteral and intravenous access problems, uh, consideration of autologous intestinal reconstructive surgery of the complications ensue, and intestinal transplantation considerations. The other thing that we have to uh, battle are really the 
uh, issue of adolescent assumption of self-care. Uh, we are in, uh, have a, uh, a quality improvement initiative, as, mo as many intestinal failure uh, centers do, where we try to get our inter interdisciplinary group to foster knowledge in our adolescents, uh, the responsibility to take responsibility for their own care, uh, demonstrate capability to perform current management, uh, 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 things that they need to do, for instance, uh, addressing changes, and the ability to assess options for the future. So we have to educate them as to which uh, things in the field are moving forward and what their options are uh, as uh, 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 they turn to adults. The skills they need to do uh, 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 include administering uh, enteral nutrition, uh, administering the parenteral nutrition, doing their own line care, uh, doing their fe feeding tube care as uh, uh, applicable to each individual. Although this sounds simple, uh, uh, it's not. And uh, uh, again, uh, uh, adolescents in general uh, are not the most compliant of individuals. And it's really important that they have detailed uh, um, uh, uh, care. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, when they reach 20, they don't magically uh, become uh, 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 non-teenagers and start acquiring knowledge and demonstrating good skills. They still need uh, incredible oversight. The other thing is that we have to socially integrate our uh, teenagers. Uh, they, what we have found is the majority of our teenagers graduate from high school, uh, and uh, then they need to, uh, to form some sort of an independent life as productive members of society. And uh, uh, this involves transition to higher education and employment. Uh, we have had uh, uh, kids go to college uh, on home parental nutrition. Uh, remarkably, we've had one child go to college on home parental nutrition and uh, hemodialysis, so it is possible. There are huge impediments to transition of care. Uh, comparable multidisciplinary adult intestinal failure programs may not exist, and the reason is that uh, uh, over time, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, not uh, um, continue the uh, model of interdisciplinary care that we have in pediatrics. Um, there are many reasons for this. One is uh, that it's not important, not as important in uh, uh, many uh, uh, general hospitals to have such uh, uh, large teams. And uh, 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 what is happening now is that they are really not prepared to handle uh, the uh, uh, large uh, uh, cohort of patients that uh, we are soon to deliver to them or try to deliver to them. Uh, the impediments to transition of care also occur on the patient side. After establishing long-term relationships, uh, 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 sometimes they are afraid uh, to leave a position of comfort. And it may be something as simple as a relationship that they develop with a social worker, for instance, or a favored uh, clinician. Uh, we've also noticed the phenomenon of reverse referral, uh, where adult patients come to pediatric intestinal failure programs. And that's because uh, by dint of uh, volume and uh, uh, um, uh, also interest, uh, they have become the expert centers. So, the oldest patient that we have in our program was 72 years old, which is certainly not a child. And uh, uh, we do this as a consultative thing, but it just shows that there's an absence of expertise in the adult realm. So what are the solutions? These solutions are difficult uh, to uh, uh, ferret out, and these are just the partial solutions that uh, some centers, including ours, have uh, uh, tumbled upon. Uh, firstly, the pediatric interdisciplinary clinics uh, have no age maximum. So as outpatients, we will tend to see anyone. 
Of course, the majority of these patients, the huge majority, have pediatric diseases as their uh, uh, initiating factor or diseases that are presented in adulthood, such as medgut volvulus, that have a pediatric etiology. Uh, in our center, operations for all patients uh, less than uh, uh, or equal to 35 years of age, uh, we can do without prior approval from the hospital. Uh, others need to be in discussion with anesthesia, and we need to have some humility in this in that uh, pediatric uh, centers are not really ideal for adults. The diseases of adults, such as coronary artery diseases and uh, uh, common cancers, uh, are actually incredibly rare in uh, uh, pediatric uh, 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 in pediatric care. So we try to focus on transferring our adults to an adult program, sometimes actually often with continued pediatric clinical uh, uh, input. The major problem, even in a center like uh, uh, Boston, which has uh, incredibly sophisticated adult hospitals, is that there are very few uh, individuals and programs that are interested in taking care of these patients. And we have uh, uh, some superb co cooperative uh, uh, physicians. However, uh, um, uh, really only one uh, uh, center where we can consistently uh, send our patients. And uh, uh, as we said before, uh, often our patients are reticent to go. And the type of care that they get uh, is uh, often not uh, as, uh, um, uh, I would say, comforting to them as they get in a pediatric center. And this is certainly something we need to uh, uh, work on. Ultimately, uh, if we take a look at other diseases, such as cystic fibrosis, the volume of patients that, uh, ult that, that gets to adulthood uh, uh, ends up uh, interesting uh, adult hospitals. So if we have a very large number of adult patients that we have successfully uh, um, uh, gotten to survive and flourish, then I think it will be a natural phenomenon that adult hospitals will take an interest. Uh, and uh, uh, I suspect and hope that that will happen over time. Another innovation that uh, uh, we have done and others, other places uh, have also, is to put an adult ward within the pediatric hospital. This is important because one doesn't really want teenagers and more importantly, the teenagers themselves don't want to be on a ward where there are uh, toddlers and neonates. And certainly, uh, when they become adults, they would prefer not to be in such a ward. And the nurses on this ward can be more expert in uh, the treatment of adolescents and adults. And as we alluded to before, adolescent to adult care transitions are not unique to intestinal failure. Uh, they're uh, particularly common in uh, cardiac uh, care with congenital heart disease, and also in cystic fibrosis. Um, pediatric hospitals, uh, uh, as a generalization, have become more willing to continue care into adulthood, uh, which is a good uh, stopgap method. Um, eventually, specially trained uh, med-ped clinicians uh, will be able to act as uh, um, uh, the guides for our patients, and they can understand both the pediatric issues that have caused the problem and then also take care of the more uh, uh, chronic adult problems that evolve over time. Uh, this uh, picture that you see here is the adult transition program that we have within our hospital, which is a, a, a ward uh, within the pediatric hospital. Uh, I think overall, uh, uh, transition to adult care is a work in progress. It's going to become more and more important as uh, uh, our uh, uh,
surviving uh, patients uh, uh, reach uh, that point in large numbers. And I'd welcome your questions. Thank you. Okay, now we will begin the questions and answers sessions. If you haven't done so already, feel free to submit your questions in the questions section of the toolbar on the right side of your screen. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Okay, Dr. Jasek, we have some coming in. So for the first one, how early should patients be transitioned? And what if they have multiple health issues or a very comp complicated patient? So the, uh, the question of transition is an interesting one. It involves two things. One is when they should uh, assume self-care or try to assume self-care, provided that they're cognitively capable of doing so. Uh, in our own program, we try to foster that uh, at age 12, and then we have certain uh, elements which we have uh, um, uh, codified that we like the patient to take care of themselves. Ultimately, uh, the uh, uh, Rubicon for us is when they graduate from high school. Once they've graduated from high school, uh, they we would like them to uh, have uh, uh, some sort of an adult uh, uh, provider. And uh, um, it's analogous to them transitioning from a pediatrician uh, to a, uh, a general practitioner or internist. Now, the person that needs to take over their care has to be uh, much more uh, 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 well-trained uh, and in-depth trained about intestinal failure than a uh, general internist. But that's what we would like to do. Uh, what happens, in fact, is that uh, uh, we rarely accomplish that transition within that uh, uh, time frame. And uh, uh, it's really during their uh, 20s and 30s that the true transition uh, uh, tends to occur. And as I say, uh, uh, even then the challenge is finding, uh, 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 accepting uh, programs that will uh, take these uh, children. Great. Next question we have coming in is, does the pediat pediatric subspecialist have to release the patient for the family to find an adult subspecialist? So the answer to that is no. Uh, and uh, uh, there can be joint care. Uh, we uh, have that uh, 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 phenomenon with one of our uh, uh, centers uh, in Boston. Uh, it really requires uh, uh, um, uh, cooperation and trust between the uh, two uh, 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 groups. Um, I think there's a lot of benefit in that. And then as time goes on, one would naturally have the pediatric program, program have less and less influence, but still have some perhaps throughout life, mm -hmm. while the adult program takes more and more uh, of the uh, uh, initiative. Great. How many pediatric hospitals have a transition to adult care unit? Uh, the very large ones uh, generally do, uh, but uh, uh, it's very hard to even pin down what one considers a pediatric hospital. So it's uh, hard for us to do that uh, uh, in a numeric fashion. Okay, what center do you currently transition pediatric patients to? So by dint of uh, 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 personal uh, uh, interactions and because uh, they'd had a long act, long standing uh, uh, program, we uh, transition our patient to uh, 
uh, Dr. David Burns' uh, program at the Leahy Clinic. Uh, um, but these things are uh, in, are really contingent on uh, patient approval of that also. And we have many national and international patients, probably an equal group to the number that we have locally. So obviously those we can transition uh, to a uh, place in Boston. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jaksik, do you create a transition plan for each patient and what does the plan include? So the transition plan uh, is really tailored to the, the patients and um, there are some patients where uh, because uh, uh, there are other uh, issues involved where a true transition to an adult center completely can't occur. Uh, they're few and far between. Uh, what we usually try to do is decide whether a, a patient is uh, 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 capable of transitioning to an adult center. If uh, they can, uh, and then we really encourage it. So the first thing is really to discuss with the family and the patient about the benefits of transitioning to an adult center. Um, uh, but the relative infrequent number, the relatively low number of adult centers makes this difficult. But then we, uh, uh, the, the, when the transfer occurs, uh, it has to be really a clinician to clinician detailed communication, uh, pharmacist to pharmacist uh, communication of exactly what we are uh, 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 doing. And the last step, if a patient's on PN, the adult program will assume the responsibility for writing the PN. Um, so it's a phased process. It's uh, um, uh, one that uh, uh, is, uh, uh, if one has a willing partner, it's quite doable, but uh, uh, it's not easy. And the first, the first part is really have to discuss with the family and really encourage them that uh, 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 ultimately adult uh, program is best. It becomes much easier once the patients get into their 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. Great. If a transitioning pediatric patient requires surgical interventions, what is the best way to identify an adult surgeon capable of addressing surgical needs? What type of pediatric slash adult collaboration is happening in the surgical world? So uh, uh, one of the things that uh, um, uh, has occurred with the evolution of uh, uh, some uh, major pediatric hospitals, I think certainly the larger ones, is that they are affiliated with adult centers. So they're an adult center right beside them. Uh, in our case, we're joined by a bridge, the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And uh, uh, very rarely there will be uh, operations which uh, uh, adult surgeons are not comfortable uh, doing. Uh, and uh, when that happens, what we have done is we have obtained uh, temporary privileges uh, at the Brigham uh, Women's Hospital, and then we have gone over and done the uh, surgery there. Um, in the realm of the lines, uh, um, uh, whether it be IR or uh, um, uh, basic surgery where uh, a central line is put in, uh, in the OR, uh, most adult providers are very comfortable with uh, doing those. And uh, uh, if there's direct communication between the pediatric center and the adult center, um, uh, uh, excellent results can be obtained. Um, there's no official uh, um, uh, surgical uh, uh, group that sort of is, is adult and pediatric trained, but it's important to know that all pediatric surgeons first have to fully train as adult general surgeons. So they're board certified in adult general surgery. And then they do pediatric surgery and become pediatric 
surgeons and board certified in that. So in a sense, they are the transition. They can understand what adult general surgeons know, what they know in addition to that, and then they can work with uh, colleagues who are interested in uh, uh, nutrition uh, uh, and uh, uh, intestinal rehabilitation in the adult realm. Uh, a, a practical way you could do it is to take a look at adult surgeons who are members of the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, and uh, often uh, uh, they will uh, either know of a surgeon who is interested uh, in taking care of intestinal failure patients, or they are such surgeons themselves. Great. Will insurance cover adult patients if they stay with, pediat with a pediatric provider? Uh, the short answer is yes, uh, although as with uh, any uh, insurance question, uh, uh, there is much more detail than that, but uh, overall there is no uh, prescription that the pediatric provider can care for adults. And, and it's for the reason that I mentioned in that certainly in pediatric surgery, uh, um, there are uh, the the uh, provider is board certified in uh, 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 adult general surgery. So that's not difficult. Uh, in the realm of uh, GI, dietitians, pharmacists, there's a uh, uh, sufficient overlap uh, that again, we have not encountered any practical problems uh, in obtaining that insurance approval. Sometimes there's a, a problem with an insurance approval to a specific uh, hospital. Pediatric hospitals, unfortunately, tend to be more expensive than their uh, uh, um, uh, associated uh, uh, general hospitals, and that's because pediatric hospitals require so many more services that are so much more complex than uh, general hospitals. Excellent. We have another question coming in. Does Boston Children's accept new patients age 20 for CAIR? If not, what centers offer the same level of expertise for patients on TPN? So there are, you know, uh, I'll, I'll answer the last first. Uh, I think that uh, there are probably about uh, uh, 20 uh, uh, um, centers uh, in the United States uh, that uh, uh, are uh, uh, true intestinal failure centers, and that's, uh, you know, an estimate there, and it's not a precise number. Uh, the uh, We certainly do take patients that are older for uh, uh, second opinions uh, and uh, uh, also for uh, occasional assumption of care and very... Uh, 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 specific instances uh, uh, in older patients. Excellent. Next question, how can pharmacies help patients find adult health care providers? I'm sorry, how can pharmacies? Yes. I, I didn't. How can uh, pharmacies okay. help patients find adult health care providers? Sorry, I, I missed it. Uh, it's just the connection. What is this? How can how can pharmacies help oh, patients? Oh, pharmacies. Got it, got yes. it, got it, got like it. Yeah, no, no, that's what I thought the question was, <laughs> well, <laughs> which, is, which is a good question. So, so the uh, uh, real question is where is there a list of physicians uh, that are interested in uh, uh, taking care of this? Uh, the answer is uh, uh, there isn't such a listing. Again, uh, the American Society of Parental and Children's Nutrition uh, would be a, a good uh, source of adult uh, 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 providers. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's that that one has to go to uh, uh, search engines and try to uh, delve into uh, various uh, websites uh, associated with uh, uh, hospitals. Great. Let's see, we have time for about two more questions. Uh, advice on forms or approaches to use to assure a smooth 
thorough transition? Well, that, that's an excellent question. We're in the process of developing our own forms. I think the, the, the first thing that one wants to do is to determine, uh, um, and the first thing we look at is whether uh, patients will be their own uh, uh, health care uh, um, uh, de determinator, if you will, that they will determine what they want and they will decide uh, what they want to uh, do. If they're cognitively capable uh, to, of doing that, then one also has to uh, uh, somehow decide whether their parents will or will not have access to the record. That's the first thing. Uh, then after that uh, is uh, accomplished, uh, uh, then uh, you have to really find a uh, program which will that particular patient, and it ultimately comes down to uh, clinician to clinician, detailed uh, verbal and written communication about what the patient needs and requires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's no specific one form that will fit for all, that fits, fits for all, sadly. Uh, we do have uh, certain criteria that we like all patients to attain at certain ages, uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, uh, the actual transition uh, requires a, a detailed uh, uh, conference call between all of the physicians as a minimum. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent advice. Last question I think we have time for is uh, when TPM patients are transferred to adult, they're seldom followed by a dietitian. What is the norm? So the norm would be that they would be followed by a dietitian, uh, and uh, uh, that's a, a flaw in uh, uh, adult care. I would say probably uh, as 1990s evolved, uh, there was a diffusion of expertise in terms of true nutritional services within hospitals and, and nutritional support uh, services, and uh, the loss of that has uh, resulted in a lack of integration between uh, dietitians and physicians in uh, some adult hospitals. So it's a problem, but it should be an expectation. Okay, great. Well, we have run out of time, and we will post answers to the rest of the questions on the OLE website. I think we just have a couple more that we'd need to cover. Listed here are pages on the OLE website where you will find resources for pediatric transitioning to adult care. Thank you, Dr. Jaksik, for an excellent presentation. We appreciate you sharing your expertise. Many thanks to Quorum CVS Specialty Infusion Services for supporting this important educational program. Thank you also to participants for joining us today. We'll post a recording of the presentation on the OLE website in case you'd like to view it again. We hope you will join us for another webinar. To view our schedule of upcoming webinars and past recordings, visit the OLE website at ole.org slash webinars. That's all for today. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much.